Well, if you can open your Bibles to the book of Colossians, chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2, and let me just say, if you are age 7 and under, can you raise your hand real quick if you're 7 and under? Hey, I just want to say I love having you in these chairs, so thanks for being here. I don't get to talk to you like this very often, huh? So that's pretty great. Thank you for being here. I promise I won't talk on and on and on. It'll be somewhat short, okay? So thanks for being patient with me. All right, Colossians chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. I'm going to read uh, somewhat of the whole paragraph. We're just going to zero in really just on a couple of sentences uh, at the end here. But let's begin reading in verse 13. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Have you ever seen a picture, or maybe you've seen it physically, the inside of an old-fashioned clock? Maybe you've seen, maybe even some of you kids have seen that, those old-fashioned clocks where they have the face on the front of it with just the hands and the numbers, but behind it, there's all of these gears and mechanisms, and they go round and round and round and round. It's just very complex. And the bigger the clock, the more complex it is. Well, in some ways, Good Friday, what we're celebrating today, is a little bit like that. On the surface of it, something brutally simple obvious is taking place. Jesus Christ, the Jewish teacher, the one who claimed to be the Lord and the Messiah, is led by Roman soldiers to a hill. His hands and his feet are nailed to a cross beam of wood. It is lifted up into the air, set in its place, and he hangs there for hour after hour after hour, gradually suffocating until he eventually dies. It's simple and brutal, what we think about on Good Friday. That's on the surface. But behind the surface, there's incredibly complex things going on. It's not just a man dying on a cross. Actually, lots of people over the centuries have died on crosses. The Romans killed a lot of people that way. It was a brutal form of death, a brutal form of execution. It prolonged the suffering as long as possible before a person would finally expire. And yet, there was something unique about Jesus' death that was not the case in all of those other crucifixions. There was something behind the face of it, behind the brutal face of what was going on. There was an overwhelming theological activity taking place. And that's what Paul, writing this little passage in this wonderful book of Colossians, is talking about. He's talking about what's happening behind the brutal face of the crucifixion. Behind the obvious physical horror of it, the obvious terror of a a torturous death like this by by the Romans, he's saying, "What's, what's happening from God's perspective if you take away just the face of what's going on and look kind of behind the surface and ask what's going on back in God's mind on the cross. And I just want to make two points right from this, this little verse at the end of Colossians chapter 2. Just, just two sections. First of all, forgiveness through cancellation, and then cancellation through crucifixion. All right, forgiveness through cancellation, and then cancellation through through crucifixion. So if you look at this verse, I just want to zero in on the, the final phrases here uh, of, the, of this little paragraph. It says, God made us alive together with him. How did he do that? He had forgiven us all our trespasses. That means he no longer counted all of our sins against us. He, he no longer saw us as heading towards his judgment. He he no longer held them against us. 
He no longer did that. He forgave us, but there was a means of him doing that. The way he forgave us was by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demand. So what Paul is picturing here is a, a, a person who is kind of there before God, and he pictures the law and its legal demands and our failure to meet those demands almost like an accuser. Almost like a, a public accusation. So if you can imagine standing before a judge and having someone publicly accuse you of sin after sin after sin. That, that's kind of like what he's saying here. Our record stood against us. It stood accusing us. It was us and our record before God. And that record was horrific, it was overwhelming. It was filled with all kinds of thoughts of evil and cravings of evil and pride and selfishness and, and lust and self-confidence and arrogance and theft even in our minds like covetousness and all these kinds of things. This record stood there against us, accusing us, and what God chose to do was to forgive all of that record. But the way he did that was very important. He forgave it by canceling it. What we believe about Jesus and the gospel and God is not merely forgiveness by oversight. All right, and those are, those are big words, kids, so thanks for sticking with me, okay? It's not just that God forgave us and just chose to not think about that anymore, as if that's all that happened. It's not just that God kind of covered over our sins and walked away and said, I don't want to look at that anymore. If, if you can imagine a, a messy room, and God just put all of the mess and shoved it under the bed and said, I do not want to think about that anymore. It doesn't do anything with it. It's still there, but God's just choosing not to think about it. We might think of forgiveness that way. Like God just shoved all the mess in the room under the bed and just chose not to look there anymore. But no, that's, that's not what God did. What God did, if I can use the same analogy, it is as if he made that mess in our room disappear. It's not just shoving under the bed to be not looked at right now. It's as though it disappeared. He canceled it. It's forgiveness by cancellation. It is removed from your record. It's not merely overlooked in your record, and that's good news. Because I think there's a big difference from forgiveness by overlooking and forgiveness by cancellation. Don't you think there's a big difference between those two things? When God removes something from your record, when he causes it to disappear from your record, he cancels it in that regard, that's different than just choosing not to look at something that's still there. Because if he chose not to look at it and it's sort of still there, then Eventually, he could run out of patience and say, look at all this stuff under my overlooking. Look at all this terrible stuff that's here. Like the mom, maybe, that goes into the room and says, this is not a clean room. Look under your bed. God could do that. He could say, I've been overlooking long enough. Look what is down here. I've overlooked and I've overlooked and I've o I can't overlook any longer. But that's not how God chose to forgive us. We, we need to read this verse with a fresh appreciation. What did he do? He, what did he do? He, he made us alive. He had forgiven all our trespasses. How? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. So God caused this accusing record to abruptly vanish. God abruptly caused this record to suddenly not be there anymore. If you can imagine that moment, the, the guilty one stands in front of the judge, and there's this accusing record of sins calling out against them. Punishment, punishment, punishment. This is such a dis disobedient child. Punishment, punishment. And all of a sudden, there's silence. And the accused sinner turns, and that accuser, it's not there anymore. The record has been canceled, not just muted, not just temporarily paused, canceled, vanished. Your forgiveness, if you are a Christian, is based on a canceling 
of the record of debt that stood against you with its legal demand. So there's a, there's a cause. Good Friday has a, a sort of a, a string cause. You have to follow along the logic. What did God do? He forgave us by canceling the record of debt. But then it keeps going. It keeps going. How did that cancellation take place? How did God do that? It doesn't seem just, and no person who is, uh, say, been, been uh, uh, there's some crime has been committed against them. No person would think it was just if the judge abruptly said, be silent and allow this murderer to live, to go free. Be silent. No, no one would think that's a good judge, but, but, but he, he's, he's murdered my family member. Be silent. No more accusations. Yes, but he, he burned my house to the ground. Be silent. No more accusations. Yes, but he's, he's stolen and robbed and taken what doesn't belong to him and, and, and ruined my life. Be silent. No more accusations. Let this guilty one go free. No one would think a human judge righteous if they said something like that, but that's exactly what God says. He canceled the record of debt. Canceled. Go free. You're free. You're free. Go home. How did he do that? and remain God the just judge. How did he do that? How did the cancellation take place? Well, the passage explains. There's forgiveness through cancellation, and secondly, there's cancellation through crucifixion. You see that in the passage? He forgave us all of our trespasses. How did he do that? By canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. How did he do that? This, this record of debt, he set aside, nailing it to the cross. How did he cause it to vanish? Well, he sent it somewhere. He sent that record somewhere. And according to this passage, he sent it to the cross and he nailed it there. He sent that record, that record of our sins, to the cross and he nailed it there. So there's cancellation, how? Through crucifixion. When I was a boy, I watched the cartoon version of Robin Hood, I think, like nine million times. Maybe it was eight million. I mean, it was right up there. So many times. I watched it over and because it was just, it's such a great, it's such a great movie. I watched it over and over and over again. Robin Hood, you know, is a fox and it's this whole thing. And, and somewhere in the movie, I think at the very beginning, there's a poster if, you, if you've ever seen the movie, there's a poster, and it goes up on the tree, and it says, Robin Hood, outlaw, right? It's a poster. It's right there up there on the tree, outlaw. And what that means is, if you catch this guy, we will give you a lot of money. What is it saying? It's saying, this guy has been published as a lawbreaker, and we are going to take him down, All right? It was published. It was declared, this record, well, Robin Hood is kind of the good guy, right? Well, imagine at the end of the story, you have all those bad, mean guys, and they're in prison. Well, imagine if they escaped and you had a publication for them. Bad guys, catch them, and there will be a reward. Bad guys, punish them, and there will be a reward. That's what our record of debt was like. Bad guys, bad ladies, bad people. Punish them. Punish them. Here's what God did with that record. He set it aside, and where did he set it? He didn't just discard it. He didn't lose it, like my keys half the time. No, he didn't lose it. He set it somewhere. He set it on the cross, it says, and he nailed it there. Do you see that? He nailed that record of debt on the cross. He nailed it on the cross. Let me ask some questions, because there's two ways you can answer this question. What was nailed to the cross? Well, on the surface of it, Jesus was nailed to the cross. Jesus was nailed to a cross. But you can ask it the question a separate way. What was nailed to the cross? My record of debt was nailed to the cross. The Bible says both. Jesus was nailed to the cross. My record of debt was nailed to the cross. What's the only explanation for both of those things being nailed to the cross? Jesus was so identified with my record of debt that when he was nailed to the cross, 
My record was nailed there with him. Jesus was so identified that Paul can literally say, my record was nailed to the cross. God so saw Jesus as being the bearer of my record that Paul can say, without any hint of concern or shame or embarrassment, my record was nailed to the cross on that day. This he set aside. How, Paul? How did he set it aside? It's been canceled. It was set aside. How did it get set aside? Where did it go? It was nailed to a cross. But it was not nailed to a cross. Yes, it was. Because it was put on Jesus in such a way that when he was nailed there, it was nailed there too. On the cross, Jesus was being identified fully with my record of debt. It was as though all of our sins were hanging there, being nailed to the cross. It was as though all of my record of debt, every single thing I've done wrong, was hanging there, was impaled there on the cross. That's what Good Friday means. It means my sins were crucified. They were as crucified as Christ was. So what hang there, what hung there on the cross? What, what was it hanging there in the body of Jesus Christ? What was hanging there? My anger and your anger was hanging there on the cross. My selfishness and your selfishness, it was hanging there on the cross. My unforgiveness and your unforgiveness. My anxiety and fear and yours, my gossip and slander, and yours, my lust and idolatry, and yours, my pride, and yours. It was hanging there on the cross. From God's perspective, and God can see right through the face of the thing, and he sees right behind to the real mechanism of what's going on. What does he see? He sees me in my sinfulness hanging there on the cross. He sees my sinfulness hanging there to death. And he sees that record receive its death punishment. He sees it breathing its last. He sees it hanging there, limp, fully punished. That's what he sees on the cross. That's what Paul is saying. This he set aside. Where? Where, Paul? Where did he set it aside? He set it aside with its legal demands by nailing it to the cross. This is the power of the cross. It means that our sin was so identified with Jesus Christ that when he died, your sin died with him. Your worst sin, your forgotten sin, your overlooked sin, your stubborn sin, your persistent sin, your to date concealed sin, your ancient sin, your painful sin, your marital sin, your parenting sin, your brotherly sin, your sin was nailed to the cross and you bear it no more. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. So let's back this verse up. There is crucifixion, and therefore there is cancellation. There is cancellation, and therefore there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness, and those who are forgiven, God has also made alive in him. That's why Good Friday is good. Forgiveness 
through cancellation, cancellation through crucifixion. When we take the face off of that clock and we look back in there, we see the infinite glory of Jesus Christ dying for us, rescuing us by bearing our sin, taking it to the grave with him, never to rise again. That record has been canceled because he bore it for us. And in him, God now sees us as if we had not committed that sin. And instead, we are clothed in his righteousness. That is Good Friday. When you go home this evening, if you are a Christian, and you wake up tomorrow, and you wake up 40 years from now, or you die four years from now, you will stand before God, and he will not be seeing your sin as a record against you. And if you're here, and you're one of those seven and under guys that I was talking to earlier, and you're here, and you're listening to me like you don't usually get to, you can believe in Jesus. You don't have to be too young. There's not like an age limit for believing in Jesus. If you believe in Jesus, that he paid the punishment of your sins, and I'm just like you. I grew up in the church, and I know that you know a lot of good answers about Jesus, but you still sometimes disobey mommy and daddy and God. And you need Jesus to pay the punishment for your sins. What I tell my kids is that we need Jesus to take the big, big punishment for us. And you need Jesus to do that too. And if you believe in him, he will take that for you. And you can know God and you can be saved as well. Let me invite the worship team to come back and we'll sing a final song. Let me encourage us as we sing and as we anticipate Sunday morning that we in our own minds list through those areas where we're aware that left to ourselves, we would only have a record of debt standing to accuse us. Let's, if we can, mentally in our minds, let's place that record where it actually is, on the cross, and enjoy the good news that because he nailed it there, we have forgiveness through cancellation. Let's sing together. <laughs>